Good morning, everyone. It is 10 o'clock. We're going to get started on time. All righty. I want to welcome everyone this morning. This is our second meeting. Uh, we had a, have a nice agenda today. Ms. Beth Overman will be speaking and Mr. Charlie Martin. So uh, looking forward to hearing from uh, those two individuals. Uh, second on the agenda, uh, we have the I need a motion for the approval of the previous meeting summary minutes. Um, has everyone had a chance to look at those while we were here? Uh, any changes, any corrections? Ms. Worth, uh, if you can go you ahead. Push that. Thank you. Thank you. This is a request for a supplement. Uh, we were read the char our charge. Could we get that added to the minutes so that at the end of the process we can check ourselves and see if we did what we were accountable for doing? And also, although this is on this pack, the address to uh, the URL for locating these documents, could we get that added to the minutes as well? And with those two changes, I recommend approval of the minutes. Okay, thank I you. Move approval of minutes. Thank you. Second. I have a motion in the second. Um, are we still voting via the electronic? You want me to start it? I can do it. Okay. All right, that's fine. Um, motion in favor, please raise your hand. All right, motion passes. Thank you. Mm -mm. Okay. Uh, section three, uh, Beth Overman, program manager, purchase of development rights. Good morning. And Mr. Chair, while Beth is coming to the lecture, I just want to remind the, the committee that we are being broadcast live on Lex TV. So please use your microphones when you speak so that the television can pick that up. And the meeting will also be uh, archived for, for viewing later on as well. Thank you. Okay, good morning. Um, so for the members, you all have in your packets um, the presentation that I'm gonna give, and on the top should be five maps, and you are welcome to just rip those off and set and use those to reference. They are in this presentation, but I provided you all larger copies so that you can see. So if you'll just take those um, five pages and um, keep them at the side, then that will help you all to see what we're going to discuss. So we will start out with the PDR program background. So the rural service area at Fayette County is comprised of some of the highest quality soils in the nation. The prime farmland soils are illustrated in green in this map to the right and the statewide important soils are in yellow. So you all can see that they essentially the prime farmland and statewide important cover nearly the entire rural service area, except some patches down there near the Kentucky River area. Recognizing the importance of protecting these special soils in our working farms, the PDR program was created in the year 2000. The program was created in conjunction with the comprehensive plan update and included changing the minimum lot size in the rural service area from 10 to 40 acres. The ordinance stated goal is to purchase easements on 50,000 of the approximately 128,000 acres in the rural service area. So our environmental priorities, the rural land management plan, which governs the whole rural area, not just the PDR program, recognizes five distinct focus areas and states they are especially important to conserve. They are based on watersheds and let's see, clicker here. This is the first time I've been in this <laughs> building, but how do we do the, the point? Okay. Well, okay. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. All right. So, 
We have the South Elkhorn, the Old Frankfort Pike, the North Elkhorn Creek. This is the wellhead protection area that's the Royal Aquifer. Over here we have the Boone Creek focus area and down here the Kentucky River focus area. So those are the five um, focus areas that are especially important to conserve per the R Rural Land Management Plan. PDR applicants receive a high number of ranking points for being in a focus area or the Royal Springs Aquifer Wellhead Protection Area. Being in these areas also negates any negative points awarded for being in the urban service, for being near the urban service boundary or in a sewerability area. PDR applicants also receive points for protecting our environmental elements as shown on the next slide. So some of our ranking. So any, PD, any parcel in the AR zone that is at least 20 acres qualifies for easement purchase. Parcels are ranked using a land evaluation and site assessment system provided in section 2610 of the Code of Ordinances that includes um, some of the ag supportive scoring is the size of the parcel, the soil quality, elimination of undeveloped non-conforming tracks, which means if someone combined two, 20 acre, or two 10 acre tracks to qualify for PDR or anything that reached 20 or above, proximity to other PDR farms, which builds critical mass, while um, batch application, farming activities and production, and agricultural infrastructure improvements. The environmental protection scoring is for environmentally sensitive areas, designated rural greenways, designated focus areas, natural protection areas, and wildlife habitats, links to parks, nature preserves, nature sanctuaries, etc., and designated scenic view sheds and other scenic resources such as tree canopies. We also have historic protection scoring. Historic and, the historic and cultural resources, including those designated for the National Historic Register, designated federal, state, and local scenic byways, and historic turnpikes, stone fences, and length of public road frontage. We also have negative scoring. Negative points are awarded to parcels in sewerability categories one through four, and those within one mile of the urban service area unless they are in a designated focus area or wellhead protection area, or they are de deemed a community icon. So our conserved farm and acreage, PDR is nearly two thirds of the way to the 50,000 acre goal, which is fabulous. There are nearly 31,100 acres permanently conserved and nearly 2,100 acres are under contract. There are an additional 12 applications in the queue and the annual PDR application cycle will take place this fall. It is a goal of both the PDR program and the federal matching program to create clusters of contiguous conserved agricultural land and you will see that on this map. Applicants receive points for being adjacent to a PDR or bluegrass land conservancy easement and for applying with a neighboring farm. The Bluegrass Land Conservancy holds 18 easements in Fayette County, totaling 2,300 acres. The PDR program has also avoided the Emerald Choker by awarding negative points to parcels adjacent to the urban service boundary and those in a sewerability area, unless they are in a focus area or the wellhead protection area. So I'm gonna show you all a few things on this map just to illustrate kind of what we're talking about um, about the importance of building contiguous farmland and conserved um, areas and how that works and also with the, um, some of the, um, how we have avoided the areas that are right by the boundary. So, um, let's see. So last year, well, I'll stay in my, <laughs> stay here so you can hear me. So on Greenwich Pike, we had two, we closed two easements that are right in this area. And previously that was an open space. And so it connected this whole area and this section and made one big block. So the two parcels that we closed, on your all's map, they're number 518 and 22018. So you all will be able to see them easier. But that is 
what we are trying to do with PDR. And another example down here, and it's going to be a lot easier for the members who are here to see these, but on Old Richmond Road, you all will see on that map that we have four farms right in this area that are under contract. They're green but outlined in black, which means they're under contract. And when you look at those, you can see that they pulled that those by putting those under easement, they are connecting this area, this area, and this area of conserved land. Yes. Just a question. Do you have um, do we have a better copy of the map? Because I'm not able to see those numbers that you're re referencing. Okay. I can get you all. Yes, the one Andy. Is it one? Is, okay. Okay. Um, yes, that should be in your packets, and I can also s get a, a bigger copy for you all too, if needed. But so that is what we try to do is fill, look at those puzzle pieces, look at where the contiguous land or where we already have conserved land, get those parcels that are adjacent to that, and especially when they can connect areas of conserved land, that is especially important and something we are trying to do. So if you all, we wanted to share that so that you all can keep that in mind as you do your work, that almost thinking of it as a puzzle piece when you look at the map, if you see a lot of green and there's, you know, green here, green here, and a white space that recognize, oh, that's, you know, a good place for PDR. That's, that's an area that they're trying to get. And I think the planning staff will talk to you all some, will encourage avoiding that, you know, development there anyway, because some of that can be called what they refer to as leapfrog development, which they would want to avoid. So, um, but if you all, I wanted to share that so you are just aware that that is one of the big goals, is building those contiguous large areas of conserved farmland. Um, and it's a, a bonus for us is that that's one of the ranking criteria that our federal partners use, um, the ones that, the program we use that provides the funding. but for us it's just it provides those specific areas of conserved land it provides buffers for the farms that are already there so um, and it just makes those areas around town and then um, and I don't know if all of you some of the new people may not have heard the term emerald choker but that was a term used when the program started um, and to um, I think some in the development community hoped that that would be avoided and so that is part of why the points the negative points are awarded for sewerability and for being close to the urban service boundary and you can see when you look at the map that the only places that has happened are right here which is Helm Place which has a historic overlay that is actually the only H1 district in the entire rural service area and that was Mary Todd Lincoln's sister's home. And so it has historic designations. So that one, and then right here, this was actually purchased by, with ICT funding um, before the PDR program started. It was around 1999 and the LFUCG used funding from the federal ICT program to purchase that easement and then gave it to the PDR program. So you can see, other than that, the ranking system has worked. Um, and we have worked on building contiguous pieces of land while, while avoiding the areas that are adjacent to the boundary. Uh -huh. I understand there are um, areas that are under negotiation, and those have to be held in confidence. But if we follow that pattern, in terms of making choices, will we be, um, will we avoid jeopardizing any potential negotiations for things that might be under contract? So the ones under contract are marked on your map um, and that will be available. GIS has that on all the mapping. They'll be able to show you all. Um, for the most part, the ones that are, we have seven pending on a federal application and five others that do not currently qualify for federal funding. I do not think any of those are adjacent to the border or necessarily meet the criteria the council has given you all to follow about the areas you select. But I could always provide that information um, to Jim Duncan or to Commissioner Horn or that, and it could be shared with you all if that was an issue, so yes. All right, so our next one. 
So the importance of conserving 50,000 acres of working farmland. The USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service with whom we partner states it well by saying agricultural land easements protect the long-term viability of the nation's food supply by preventing conversion of productive working lands to non-agricultural uses. Land protected by agricultural land easements provides additional public benefits, including environmental quality, historic preservation, wildlife habitat, and protection of open space. And I will share that when I started with PDR, you know, everyone is aware of the reasons. We started this, um, or the program was started in the year 2000. Um, we know that it's with tourism, that it's our working farms, that the ag community being such a large part of the um, economy here and all the other reasons, the historic factors, the cultural factors. But it was interesting to me that the federal program, one of the main reasons they do this is to conserve farmland so that we always have enough land to grow food to feed our citizenry. So they see it as a homeland security issue in addition to all of the other ag benefits and um, environmental benefits and that was just interesting to me because I don't think that is necessarily how we looked at it originally but it was interesting that that is part of why they, this is funding because it is regularly funded every farm bill with bipartisan support and right now the Inflation Reduction Act has actually um, significantly increased the funding for the program for the next five years and it's gone from around four and a half million I think it's like one and a half billion per year. So they are really making an investment in conserving farmland. So that was just an interesting thing I wanted to share with you all. But, um, and though it would seem there is much land to conserve in Fayette County with nearly 120,000 acres in the rural service area, mapping provided by our GIS staff shows how much land is excluded from potential conservation due to parcel size, existing commercial usage, residential use, and developments, government-owned properties, et cetera. And so this is a map that I think GIS created this for us, and I think it will be especially helpful to you all. But so everything in green is either PDR or Bluegrass Land Conservancy or like things like the Floor Cliff Nature Sanctuary. Everything in that dark gray color is unavailable for PDR conservation because it's either a rural subdivision, it's in 10 acre tracks or smaller, you know, there are a lot, we'll see on the next slide that there are a lot of um, um, parcels a lot smaller than 10 in the rural service area. And, you know, or either it's already owned by government, it's already something like the airport, Keeneland, Basic Tipton, so all of these things that are already taking up the conserved land. So that kind of puts it in perspective of the areas um, that we will be you know, that are important for conservation and available. So the importance of conserving 50,000 acres of working farmland continued. Additionally, further GIS mapping shows that 3,224 of the parcels in the rural service area, 70%, 76% of the parcels are less than 20 acres and therefore do not qualify for PDR easement purchase. It is therefore vital that we protect the areas buffering PDR farms so that they may someday be protected and continue the pattern of contiguous conserved working farmland and so that we honor the conservation commitment of PDR's 285 farms. It also makes us good stewards of the local, state, and federal investment in these easements by ensuring farmers can continue farming and good stewards of their environment by protecting our green space streams, environmentally sensitive areas, and wildlife habitats. So on the map you all have, you will see that in the really kind of dark, and it's harder for the audience, but um, so in the really dark burgundy color, that is parcels that are zero to 4.99 acres. There are 1,675, so that is the largest group that is out there. Next is the five to 9.99 acres. There are 509 of those. And the 10 to 19.99, there are 1,040 parcels. So you can see that, as I said earlier, that over 3,000 are less than 20 acres. Then going into the 20 to 39.99, there are 276 of those parcels. 
and the 40 to 1065, which is the largest, there are 696. So that's, I think this will also be helpful to you all as you do your work. Um, and Chris George will have access to all of these and be able to um, pull these for you all as need if, as you do your work. Okay, so our helpful notes um, that will help with your all's work that we wanted to share today and our conclusion. Both the PDR and Bluegrass Land Conservancy easements are perpetual and transfer with the land. And Margaret Graves, who is the chair of the Bluegrass Conservancy, is here today if you all have any questions for her. Our board chair, Gloria Martin, is also here if you all have any questions for her. Over half of the PDR easements have been purchased with federal matching dollars from the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. The federal easement template we use includes the following language, and it has it under the section prohibited uses. The granting of easements or rights of way for power lines, gas lines, sewer lines, telecommunica telecommunication towers, and wind farms. So to put that in easier to understand <laughs> language, what that's saying is that some PDR farms come into um, the program with easements on that. We learned that in the title search, or maybe there's an old, you know, electrical easement or that kind of thing. What it's saying is that new ones cannot be added. And so for your all's work in thinking in terms of, can a sewer line go through our PDR farm? Can there be, you know, new infrastructure that's underground? It's our understanding right now, especially on these federal easements that have this language, that would not be available, so just so that you all are aware of that. Um, and then it also states, due to the federal interest in the agricultural land easement, the United States must review and approve any proposed condemnation action that may affect the United States' interest in the protected property. So I'm going to show you all something that will illustrate um, what we're talking about or why we share that with you. Um, so if you will look, and I'm just, there are a lot of roads in the rural area that this would impact, but um, let's switch. But Military Pike, because it's easy to see, it's down on the left of this map that's titled Conserved Land in Lexington Fayette County. So if you look at Military Pike, and we all know it's two lanes and somewhat narrow, um, and you see there are actually nine PDR, separate PDR easements on the road. There are two that sit back here that um, are not, you know, do not have um, road frontage, but there are nine that do. If there was ever, if like this group decided, we need to expand, we want to develop that area, so it's gonna need to go to four lanes you would have to get the permission of the federal government. It is our understanding. You would have to get the permission of the federal government per the language in the easement to do so. And it is unlikely they would allow that. And it's our understanding from conversations with them and things that with them being the federal, just like the state can sometimes override what we want to do here in the city, um, the feds can just say no. We have an <laughs> easement there and we're not going to allow that. And then the condemnation process, if it ever did go through, is extremely expensive and requires repayment to the landowner, the federal government, and the LFUCG. Um, and so I just wanted to, that's something important for you all to know as you do this work. And so that will help you in looking at areas. Um, because I will, one story I will share is that um, one of the former council members um, who was in the 10th district when I first started around 10 years ago, he had an idea to expand the, um, one of the bike trails and to take it across Helm Place that is right here. And it would just have gone across the front and connected. And so he had us send a letter to NRCS and say, you know, explain it, and he kind of um, suggested that they would also be able, it would allow people to see this historic um, house as they went by and things, and they said, no, that is not the purpose of this. This is an agricultural land easement, and we, you know, we're not gonna take up space for paving for that. So I just wanted to share that to let you know how strict it is. Um, that's our experience with it. Um, so I think that is helpful to you all as you do your work. 
Um, and so that concludes my presentation. We want to thank you for inviting us today. We gracious and um, we greatly appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all and answer any questions throughout the process. So um, if you all have any questions for me, for Gloria, for Margaret, we will be happy to answer. Uh, yes, I'm sure you have several questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. Beth, oh, it's louder than I thought. Um, my question has to do, when a PDR farm is next to a non-PDR farm, do you have recommendations on buffering, and uh, or do you, do you actually have that in place? I mean, do you try to keep X amount? I, I'm thinking moving forward, if there's land that's going to be developed, there are things that would be detrimental to be mm -hmm. right up to a PDR farm. Yes. So our first preference would be to avoid that um, altogether. Um, and But our board has not come up with a specific area, like whether that be a mile or, or things. So we we can discuss that at a future yeah. I think meeting. That'd be helpful. But, okay. All right, but yes, right now, um, that would just get back to the, what I talked about, about us trying to build those contiguous, and especially when there are puzzle pieces in between two areas or three areas that would fill in and things. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Kevin. Beth, just curious, the example you just gave of the trail going through the property that you um, spoke of there, the Mary Todd Lincoln sister, mm -hmm. uh, property was that because it was that historic overlay or would that apply to any PDR farms and the reason I'm asking is as you were talking about the importance of the linking and connection of all of those properties and in your positive scoring ranking process here links to parks preservation uh, nature preserves nature sanctuaries and things like that would lead me to believe that there might be a, a interest in linking a trail through some of those properties at some point? Yes, so the, I'm sure the H1 overlay would have come into play. Um, I don't remember that it got to the point of Betty Kerr's um, of the Division of Historic Preservation being consulted, but the big thing with PDR, one of the big things with PDR farms is that since 2007 they have had an impervious surface limit in the easement and that is generally 2%. And so that bike path would have been paved and would have caused that. And so they don't allow paving. Our easements also prohibit paving unless it is for agricultural or approved residential use. So Okay. So there's probably not going to be a time where we would see these connected farms to have a trail system through them because of that paving? Not a bike trail. I don't think so. Okay. But, okay. Um, and one other question that I have is, like, on the funding for the the state and local and federal uh, funding that goes into paying for the PDR easements, is that paid for in total, or is the city carrying debt on any of their part, or are there is that how how is that funded through LFUCG with our with our local dollars going into that? Okay, so. Um, it is generally given through bond funding, and it is a, sometimes we, it is, the hope has been that for $2 million has generally been the request. Um, the first year that the program started, the state pledged $15 million to start the PDR program. And so the first year they gave around seven or eight million and the LFUCG matched that. After that, it, the goal has been to give two million a year. And, but in some of the leaner years that we've had with COVID and with the um, recession around 2008 or 2009, it's been one million or sometimes there was even no money given that year. Um, and I think one year it was around 400,000. So um, it is generally through bond funding. We do not track that in PDR because we look at it, you know, I think it's just like other projects that the LFUCG funds in Lexington when they're talking about how much they spent whether it be the old courthouse or something, they talk about the dollar amount. Um, and so the interest part is done over there in finance. That's um, not something we track, but yes, it is through bond funding. Thank you. Um, thank you, Beth, for that presentation. Um, can you help me understand buffer zones a little bit better? 
Um, do they only relate to PDR farms? And um, uh, well, yeah, well, no. So, and my planning friends here may want to step in, but um, I believe, let me see if one of our maps shows it. Um, let's see. Well, and actually we do, that map is in the Rural Land Management Plan and we can send that to you. Um, some of them are right down here, this area that's over by Jesbin County, that's a buffer zone. There are a few over, others over here, but um, Jim or Chris, or does anyone want to add to that? <laughs> Vice Mayor, the buffer is, a, is both a land use and a zone, and it's designated in the Rural Land Management Plan on properties where there was a concern that there would be really no control about what happens on adjacent properties or the properties were already sized and used in such a way that they would not be appropriate for necessarily for other conservation type programs. So the, the biggest example is along Tate's Creek Road because that's also the border with Jesmond County. So that area is designated for agricultural buffer uh, and, and then therefore it can be zoned as a, for a buffer zone and that, that it can be subdivided smaller than the 40 acres. So that's really the big, the big difference in the agricultural area. The buffer zone can be subdivided smaller uh, and likely would not be as competitive for, uh, for conservation. So, so in the context of us looking for uh, expansion and development land, basically we're not looking at anything that's going to be contiguous to conserved areas then if we're considering the buffer zone, right? That's not necessarily a, a, a limitation on your part. Okay. Thank you. Beth, do you have an idea, you talked about the uses of the farmland, um, what the farms that are currently being conserved, if it's for agriculture, food production, or if it's equine, or if it's a cattle farm, and how that may play into buffering? Is there a way to break it down and let us know how they're being, how the land's being used? Yes, so we actually started tracking that over the last year. Um, so Charlie Farmer, who is a retired NRCS, the district conservationist, we contract with him to do the majority of our easement monitoring. And as we go to this farm, we have started um, writing that down. So I can gather some of that. I can tell you that the last couple of years, um, we are seeing a lot of cattle farms um, come in and a lot that are doing the general ag with the crops. It's a lot of corn and soybeans. We are even, we've even seen a couple where they're doing horses, but also corn and soybeans. So that is interesting. Um, and one of the big things that we are seeing change in Fayette too is the eventing that um, the sport horses. And so um, we see a lot of that. But I think as far as what's coming in new, we are seeing a lot of general ag and a lot of cattle farms and stuff. But I will look at how much of that data we have um, and so that we can give you all a rough idea of that. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Beth, for the presentation. Uh, a lot of helpful, useful information. Can you, so I'm of the understanding that the uh, PDR scoring system has been modified uh, in certain areas to allow for more flexibility with allowing properties to be entered into the program. Can you speak a, a little bit about that and why that might have taken place and the benefit to the program? So it actually has not. I remember we had those conversations um, when we were, like, I think when we added the council seats to the ordinance um, for PDR a couple of years ago, the two council appointed seats and the non-voting council member. And so when we were discussing some of those changes, I think that came up about farms less than 20 acres being able to apply, um, but that change has not been made yet so now what they can do is if any farm has two adjacent parcels that say it's five acres and 15 or what any combination that reaches 20 they can apply to PDR in that way and s tell us that they're going to get those consolidated we don't require them to actually do so until we've received federal funding for that easement and made an offer to them because we don't want them to go to that expense and get that you know um, consolidation plat until we know that they have an offer from us on the table so but we can certainly talk with you if you'd like to talk more about that um, okay we'd be well happy I guess I was that. I was talking more about I think there was area around uh, the bluegrass station area that okay. I think properties might have not been ranking high because of 
I don't know if it's location or other factors. And I thought an adjustment might have been made to the to the scoring system to allow for properties to be considered that or score higher that might not have scored higher. Okay, I kind of remember. I think so. I that may have been out in the Kentucky or down in the Kentucky River area. That may be what we talked about because those their soil score often does not meet the the federal government requires that the prime farmland soil and the statewide important together equal 50 percent and most Fayette County farms are up close to 100 percent. We even have some that sometimes the prime farmland soil which is the top is 100 percent itself. Um, these farms that are down let's see here. Some of these that are right down on the river, and you can see that's why some are in white. Um, they're not yet conserved. Um, they do not um, usually meet the criteria as far as the soil goes. So we cannot submit them for federal funding or have not been able to in the past. And our board has been very conscientious, especially with all of the you know, economic problems beginning in around 2008 or 2009 through the COVID of using those matching dollars. And um, so we have focused on the farms that do meet the federal requirements. Now, the federal government with the, they have a farm bill every five years. And with the 2018 farm bill, they did make some changes to allow for funding if it is of special significance because our ordinance charges our board with conserving the natural lands, as you all saw on that, how many, like a focus area is one of the top score getters um, in the ranking points and environmentally sensitive areas in the rural greenways are another top point getter. So there are ways now that we can um, apply for that. I did submit some, um, I think it was, pre-COVID, um, so maybe around 2019, 2018, I did submit a few on our federal application that were down in the Kentucky River area and they weren't funded. Um, but I think a lot of that is because the feds have their ranking system just like ours. And even though it's now recognizing the those lands of special significance, um, and one of the criteria is that if it's part of your uh, the entity like us, like our ordinance to preserve that, to try to, get those, it's still the prime farmland soils are at the top for them as well. So if they have a limited amount of money and are handing that out in Kentucky, then those farms with the best soils are going to get funded first. So, but is that okay. kind of what? Yeah, um, yeah, kind of. So, okay, yeah. but you so and I can we, also yeah, just, can you and I can get together and yeah. talk about this. That'd be well, the other thing I was going to ask too, and, it, and this is just maybe get clarification. So, so any additional easements aren't allowed on PDR farms. Uh, is that is that just general practice or is that a fact? I mean, just thinking about uh, making our uh, sewer system more efficient and, mm -hmm. and making connections, is that, you know, if there's a willing... Uh, property owner and it's not going to disturb the operations of the of the of the farm or the property is that something that we can consider or not is that just is that just a flat out no it appears to us that this federal easement that language um, on the last page let's see about um, no, there's, it's under prohibited uses, the granting of easements or right-of-ways. So I was doing some research on that last night. I saw back as far back as 2000 or two, 2008 or 2009 at least that that language has been in the federal easements. So that would prohibit, it is our understanding based on this, that would prohibit any kind of new sewer infrastructure or things. And um, so, and I think that's one thing, you know, some of our easements are local. There are times when it's probably going to be a case by case basis with the law department reviewing. And then, um, as yeah. I said, it always, if there is ever a question or a request, it has to go through the chief of NRCS in Washington, DC, if it's a federal easement. Okay. Yeah. I'd be interested in getting a legal clarification on that because if it's the difference between running a sewer line and building multiple pump stations, I think it, it, it goes into the cost of development okay. uh, consideration. So, okay, I'll make yep. a note. All right. Thank you. You're welcome, Beth. Just another clarification on Councilmember Brown's question. So, are all the farms? Is it a federal? It's a, it's a package deal, or are some just local and state? 
Are they all part of the federal? And are these contracts for life? I mean, is there ever a time when, you know, farm ownership changes hands generationally and they may have a different opinion? Um, yes. So um, the the easements are in perpetuity. And um, so a lot, over half of our easements are federally funded. In the beginning, when the state gave that 15 million, a lot of the easements there were local easements because the state is not technically, even though they gave that money, it was more like a gift to start the program. And so they are not listed as a grantor in the easement. So we refer to those as our local easements. Um, and so less than half are those. Now, those are what's something that the law department or different people would have to look, because there's other language besides what I cited. There's language about digging, drilling, all this that's in prohibited uses throughout all of the easements. Um, but this stronger language by the feds has been in there at least 2008 or 2009. I was able to see last night. So, um, but we can, I'll get with Commissioner Horn and Tracy and we'll get some more guidance for you all on that. Oh, and then the perpetuity. Yes, so um, so there are, in our ordinance, there are some ways to release the easement if that has, there are criteria that if it has been incorporated into the urban service boundary after a number of years, or um, the other criteria is that if it has, um, they can no longer farm due to development that's surrounding them. It has become impossible. They can request release. It is a very difficult process for the property owner. They have to buy um, property of equal value, both agriculturally, like the soil, and financial, and give it to the PDR program. Um, the easement that they're getting, the land that they're getting released from easement, also 20% of it has to go to the LFUCG for a park. If there's any financial difference in what they are trying to give back, they have to also pay financially. And the federal easements essentially just kind of X a lot of that out. They require the permission of them and then repayment of the government. So it is a very, it would be a very challenging process for the landowners to try to undertake. Any more questions for Ms. Oberman? Yes, Ms. Ware. I'm not sure this is Ms. Oberman or Ms. Graves, but are, are the conditions that we've talked about parallel for the lands under conservancy for the Bluegrass Land Trust? Yes. Uh, hold, hold one second. If you're going to speak, I would ask you to come up to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Margaret Graves, and I serve as the chair of the Bluegrass Land Conservancy Board. Um, the easement terms are, are similar, uh, except for that the Bluegrass Conservancy easements are donated, not purchased, and those easements are also in perpetuity with no ability to terminate under any circumstances. Um, and then there are also prohibitions against uh, easements or destroying the land for laying a sewer line, for example. Thank you. Good. Ms. Overman, thank you. Okay, thank uh, you all. Thank you for the presentation. And I'm sure we're going to have more questions at some point. Okay. So you're going to be around throughout this these meetings, correct? Yes, all right. I will. Thank you. Thank you so much. All righty. Um, so next uh, we have Mr. Charlie Martin. And the Director of Division of Water Quality. Chair, thanks. Thank you for having me. Um, it's my first time presenting in here as well, too. The last time I was here, they had one screen. So when I came in today and saw that they had two, I already started freaking out because I know that we're going to be talking about a lot of maps, not this week, but next week and the following week. And so I wonder how we're going to be able to navigate that. Uh, I have some people to help me figure out how to do that, though. I want to start out by introducing some folks over Mr. Clark's shoulder. Um, I've got two people here from Stantec Engineers. Uh, they are the consultant for developing this study. It was Joe Herman and then Brett Levy. Behind him is, is um, um, our, our stormwater, I'm sorry, sanitary sewer section manager, mouthful, Chris Dent. 
he's also working on the project as well. So they're here to help me. If you uh, stump me with a question that I ne can't necessarily answer, they're my phone friend. Um, basically, uh, I'm here sooner than I thought I was going to be. I thought I was going to be here at the end of August because um, we've been working on this report since May 4th. And so there's a lot of moving parts, and we've been going with the pedal to the metal this whole time. And so uh, really, in order to be able to be responsive to what um, you asked for for today, I tried to prepare at least a primer of trying to explain to you some of the assumptions that we have made in, in developing the study, because when we get diving into the maps and diving into the locations, hopefully then some of that background information will provide some clarity to you. Again, like I said, very much of a maps-driven and numbers-driven type of, uh, of process. Uh, it's 20,000 uh, 20, feet is the best that we could do at this point in time as far as our, our analysis. This is a, a evaluation of how to provide sewers to specific geographic regions. It's not about whether or not uh, we should sewer one area versus another, and it's definitely not about how to pay for it. Uh, we've tried to be able to put at least some level of cost associated with it. Uh, I'll talk more about that in the course of slides, but the, on the mechanism of how we paid for it is not part of the scope of this work. So the agenda, we're going to talk a little bit about how the topography drives the, the system layout, give you a little bit of a sewer primer. As I said earlier, the key points as far as the methodology that we approached in, in preparing this. Uh, talk about some potential regulatory obligations that may impact whatever decision is made by this group uh, as far as on the existing system. And then the real thing I wanted out of this, hopefully, was during the questions, comments, and discussions, some really solid guidance on how we can prepare future presentations that make good use of you all's work. So um, this map that's on the left here, there's a larger one in the back, and so I'll be around afterwards if folks want to talk to me about it a little bit more. Uh, but those are the areas at which that we studied. There's 14 areas of studied. Uh, this came out of the 2006 Rural Sewerability Study that was done prior to the consent decree. We modified it to some degree because topography in our world really drives things. Um, you know, water flows downhill, and so that's how drainage works. And so from the drainage engineer's perspective, you know, contours and catchments are what really drive our world, not roads and, and property lines. Um, past decisions made about the urban service boundary has left us with a somewhat inefficient sanitary sewer system. And one of the things that, that me representing the Division of Water Quality, we're, we're trying to advocate is that we do this whatever we do in as efficient manner as possible. So uh, I've had a couple people that have seen this and they liked my bathtub analogy here because I will try to explain to folks is that sewer systems operate like a bathtub. Basically everything drains from the top of the tub down to the drain or the outlet. And depending on the decisions that you make, it depends on how well this works. If you want to only serve this area that's here on the left, you follow these blue lines, which are streams, to where they reach a point, and then you could build a pump station there. If you decided you wanted to serve both this area and this area, then you would do the same thing that you would do the one at number two. Or you could keep playing that game, working your way downstream, and either building a pump station that pumps it to one of the drains, a treatment plant, or build a third treatment plant. What you don't want to do is have a situation to where you've excluded one parcel and created a situation to where that's sitting now right in the middle of this drainage area. What was going to be one pump station at point number one is now three. One here, one here, and one here. Three pump stations instead of one pump station. That's what the, the example I was trying to give is, is that trying to choose a, a boundary that is around the contours makes for a longer term, uh, more efficient system. And, and here's the example of reality. This is really kind of a confusing map, but the, the purple lines are the trunk sewers that serve the sanitary sewer system. So if you train your eye on this, is that basically this is the top of the hill and everything flows in this direction towards that green dot. You look even closer, you can see that there's a disconnect between the lines as you go right through there. Basically, there's a ridge that runs through the middle of Fayette County, and everything drains away from the urban core. 
which is one of the things that gives you a real challenge about trying to sewer things in, in this town. If you think about it, most cities you go to have a river that runs through it and everything drains to the middle. That doesn't happen here, and so that prevents us or provides a lot of challenges for us. The, the best watershed that we have as far as in efficiency is down here at West Hickman. This is uh, South and Christian Church there on Richmond Road. Uh, here's the Turkey Foot uh, Merrick area. Everything drains very efficiently southwards towards the Jesmond County towards the treatment plant. Very few pump stations that are in, in the West Hickman drainage area. Over here in North Elkhorn, which is Winchester Road and I-75, you see two green dots that aren't very far from one another because we drew the boundary upstream for where those str two streams join together. Again, like I said, that's one of the things that we're trying to emphasize as we go through these maps over the next couple of weeks and walk you all through this is trying to um, help make the decision in a way that is a longer term efficiency for the government. The context of efficiency I have is this, is that I have a pump station operations crew. Right now, six of the 10 industrial mechanics that I have, those positions are vacant. It's harder and harder to find operational people. And so when you talk about how to best operate the sanitary sewer system, I go back to what my professor told me in school, is that gravity is your friend. It's free and it never takes a day off. And so trying to design a system around gravity is hugely important. Okay, so here's some of the study methodology highlights I wanted to go through. First of all, uh, in a tabular form, the colors don't mean anything other than to segregate as far as which areas that we're looking at or we looked at that are the largest. The yellow ones represent the areas that are gross acres are more than 2,500 acres. The blue area is between 1,000 and 2,500, and then the unshaded are the ones that are less than 1,000 as far as gross acres. Um, I only put this in here just to illustrate that we kind of looked at a large cross section of things. You can see from the map that we basically worked all the way around the map, but we also tried to look at a variety of different sized areas. Now, gross acres is all fine and dandy, but I learned from the last time we did this in 2006 is that developable acres is really what people want to know. Uh, to add 1,000 acres and 999 of them can't be used, you really didn't add anything at all. So we went through a fairly lengthy process of trying to figure out what is developable and what is not. And you can see from the second column there that what we've determined is floodplains, parks, PDR parcels, rural residential parcels, rural settlements, and special natural protection areas are not considered to be developable. Uh, I'm going to stop there at the rural residential parcels because this is a difficult one, is that basically for this study we assumed that any parcels that are 10 acres or less and r zoned as residential are in fact residential. They're somebody's house with their swimming pool and their barn, but that's not probably always the case. Some of those cases may be that it's a much older house uh, that is in need of repair. Maybe it's just a barn. Um, you know, there's, there's no way we could figure that out right now, but I wanted to point that out. That was our assumption at this point in time. We were trying to pull those smaller parcels out to where they wouldn't be considered a part of the developable uh, metric that we were working towards. Um, I'll point your eyes to this as well because this comes in later. Flow contribution. All, some areas don't have any flow contribution but a rural residential parcel might. If they're on a septic tank right now and we did decide to expand into that area, someday that septic tank's gonna fail and most likely they'll want to connect to the sanitary sewer system or the public system. So we wanted to make sure that whatever we proposed in sizing would allow for that. And so likewise with, likewise with the, the rural sediments as well. 15 people per acre. Uh, that is a number that's going to be important later down the road. I know when I shared this with, with Jim, he was a little concerned about 15 per acre. That's what we've been using in sizing things for the consent decree to this point in time. And uh, we'll talk about it a little bit here more, but it's a really important number for us is that we decide what that number is and it, we have to stay with it. Uh, the consent decree, if anything that's come out of that, is, is that we have capacity assurance um, requirements that we never had before. And so changing from 15 to 25, and I just made that number up, that creates a huge hardship for us because we didn't size it for 25, we sized it for 15. So there's that same uh, 
table before. I have to admit, I, my coloring gave up on me, and ironworks should have been yellow, but it's not. But what you see how the gross acres turned into the developable acres after we went through that process. And what I tried to really focus on was not was, was the reduction. So let's talk about the one, number five, that I didn't color correctly. Is we started out with a pretty big area, but by the time you got rid of the other stuff that's not developable, we, nearly 70% of that area is not considered to be developable as far as part of this study. I found that to be somewhat significant because in, in from sewer world, you're going to have to put in infrastructure that covers a large area, but you're, if you're only serving a smaller percentage of those customers as, as customers and deriving revenue from them, uh, you know, I, I would suggest that we ask ourselves that question about whether that, that makes sense. The analogy I was using with somebody here a couple minutes ago is that if, if you're providing a service in a neighborhood, say, collecting garbage, if you're only collecting garbage from 10% of the houses, it may not be worth you driving your truck all the way through the neighborhood to try to do that. Same situation here is that if the reduction of the gross acres is so great that it doesn't seem to make economic sense, we might want to ask ourselves whether or not sewering that area is something that we would want to do. So we talked about the developable acres. Now we switch over into trying to figure out the capital cost. Uh, we used a proprietary costing tool that was developed by Hazen and Sawyer. There are other consultants on this serving as a sub to, to Stantec. Uh, importantly is that they, they are the same people and it's the same costing tool that we have used for consent decree projects as well. So I was comfortable that we were, we were being consistent in the way that we were doing this. These are capital construction cost estimates, no design fees, no property acquisition, none of the other administrative costs, just hard construction costs um, that they use. Their proprietary tools based on, I think, Birmingham, Alabama, along with some other information obtained from Cincinnati. So what we did is we took the capital cost estimates that were plausible. You know, each one of these areas has multiple alternatives. Oh, let me step back a second. Some only have one. Some have multiple ones, but we tried to pare it down to where we only considered the ones that were plausible, and that was based, on, I guess, on our perspective. But the idea was, was to take that cost estimate and then divide it by the developable acres to try to come up with a metric that is, what is the cost per developable acre? Again, about what makes sense to you or not. If something's a million dollars an acre and something else is $15,000 an acre, your eye's going to go to that $15,000 an acre. So what we're trying to do, what you'll see in the, in the final report is a table that summarizes that, that maybe help you make decisions about which areas you think like you want to look at closer versus the, that one's not worth our attention. Now, that metric will serve a purpose of that cost benefit, but it's not absolute because again, I said these, you'll find when we get into the maps, I mean, you could draw the lines all over the place. You could make it bigger, you can make it smaller, you can do this and do that, and so it, it's, all, it's changing a lot. Uh, we just put a, a pin in the map and said that's what it's going to be, but it's not an absolute. Uh, likewise, some of these alternatives involve a cost participation from the government in order for them to be efficient. And I'm gonna use this next slides to explain why. You know, go back to the map I had before, uh, everything drains away from us. So if we add something to the urban service boundary that's contiguous with the urban service boundary, then there are upstream customers from them. And so in an efficient standpoint, if I've got an existing pump station sitting at the edge of the boundary, then I'd want to get rid of that and move it downstream with the new pump station and be able to serve the whole area with one pump station instead of two. Now. If we did that, it's, it's proportional in cost because you couldn't expect the developers to pay for all of building the whole pump station for a part of it being the government's flow. So you see here at the bottom, this is what we've used before in expansion areas, is that if X percent of the flow is us and Y percent of the flow is you, then X percent of the cost of this new infrastructure is us and Y is you as well. So there, there, there's got to be some type of sharing of those costs, and that impacts the overall cost per developable acre. So here, here's my map example. This is probably as easy one as I could. This is actually area one. 
South Elkhorn Pump Station. It's funny that Beth talked about military pike because I'm talking about military pike too, but not for the same reasons. Um, this is Firebrook. Here's the two ponds that are there at Firebrook. But you've got South Elkhorn Pump Station. Anything that's in the South, Orn, South Elkhorn drainage area, which is this kind of yellow shaded, all has to pass through that pump station. That's how it gets the West Hickman treatment plant. It all goes through that pump station. So if you add that area and you put a new pump station where that X is, clearly you would want to be able to combine those two pump stations into one where the X is. Uh, I can tell you the neighbors would really probably prefer that because this is kind of a stinky pump station that backs up to the Palomar neighborhood. Um, it's not one of our best ones. But you know, why, why would you want to pump back to here and pump again all the way to the treatment plant? You're pumping twice, it's, it's, it's costly, it's inefficient. Instead, you'd want to get rid of South Elkhorn Pump Station and size the X such as that it handled the existing customers and the future customers. There's that opportunity of government participation along with development participa participation. So, other study methodologies of note, uh, I think I've kind of hinted at this already, but you know everything that, that we would like to see as far as if there were any expansion is that it, there would be the downstream controls would either be a pump station, a pump station with a storage tank or a treatment plant. What we don't want to see is a collection of individual small pump stations that are serving just individual parcels or sections of development. Again, that, that's a huge operational problem for us not one that I, I would recommend that, that we do. So I've sat over there listening to Beth and angsted over this slide here at all because um, she and I talked yesterday, so she, I knew this was coming. Uh, we didn't know whether or not you could put sewer infrastructure through um, a PDR farm. Uh, it's suspected that you could, and suspected you could. At the end of the day, we came back to what we have been saying as engineers. From a drainage perspective, you should serve the whole area. But again, if what they were talking about earlier, Beth was talking about in the earlier presentation is in fact true, that will change the way or impact the way that we serve some of these areas and what we're proposing in these, in these maps that you're gonna see over the next couple of weeks. Some areas don't have many PDR farms. Some of them have a lot, they have a bunch. I think it was kind of reflected in that, that table I showed before that when it shows from gross acres to developable acres, a lot of that is PDR farms. Um, another methodology is that um, from all the time we've been spending on the consent decree the last 20 years, uh, we have learned that systems age and you've got to account for um, inflow and infiltration as that city ages. And rather than trying to go back and retrofit any expansion area that we would do, that we would advocate, that we plan for in advance, because it will happen eventually. Even more importantly is, is that um, conveying wet weather flow to one of our two treatment plants is hard. One of the reasons why we've built the storage tanks that we've built as part of the remedial measures plan and consent decree obligation is that uh, upsizing the existing pipelines that run through neighborhoods is very disruptive, very, very hard. And instead, what we've chosen to do is build storage tanks, have, store it in the area that we have it until the storm goes away and then slowly deliver it back through the existing pipelines. Um, that's when, what we're proposing in this and almost every one of the alternatives that we have right now here is use the existing pipeline because Back to my original example there of South Elkhorn, that is a 36 inch pipeline that goes in Jesmond County for roughly four miles. The chances of replacing that are not very good. Uh, there's a lot of obstacles to that. So you would overcome that by building that pump station where that X was and building a storage tank right with it. That way you could still use the 36 and not over overload it. All right, almost done here. Uh, I, this is a lot of busy slide here, and I put the stuff in the bottom there just to kind of characterize what I was gonna say in the top. Um, during the course of this study and in the preparation for it, I met with a lot of different people, different stakeholders, and so I, one of the things I kept hearing from different people, well, what about a third treatment plan? You got two, why don't we do a third treatment plan? This question came up 20 years ago, and I said this then, I'm saying the same thing now. If you start today, 
you might have one 15 years from now. There are a lot of regulatory obligations that you'd have to meet in order to be able to cite a third treatment plan. I said 15 years then, and it's 15 years now. A lot of it starts with this notion of this facility plan development. You know, that's almost a third of the time right now. I'm going to come back to that facility plan development here in just a second because it keeps popping up. So what if we expanded one of the existing plans? You know, if we had to expand Town Branch or, uh, or West Hickman, they're estimating a five-year uh, effort for that, or I am estimating a five-year, because this wasn't Stantec's product, this was mine. Same kind of thing, facility plan development would be involved in that. Okay, well, we're not going to expand a plant and all that, we're just going to increase people. Uh, basically, there is a population growth uh, limit uh, in the Kentucky Administrative Regulations that says that basically if you exceed your, your existing population projection by 30%, that you have to do a facility plan. And so here's where that 15 acres reappears again. Is it 15 people per acre, the developable trigger as far as being, having to do a facilities plan is about 6,900 acres. You increase that to 21, it drops below 5,000. My advice, I guess, to the committee is, is that we keep that in the back of our back pocket of knowing that, because having to do a facilities plan is hard, and that's under normal circumstances. Our facilities plan uh, was last done in 2000. Uh, technically, it's expired. And part of the reason why it has not been renewed is, is that we can't get the state to make a decision about a discharge limit for Town Branch. Town Branch, like, most, like all treatment plants, has a wastewater discharge permit that identifies the level of pollutants. In 2003, um, there was a study done on Town Branch that, that said you need to change the amount of phosphorus that you're dumping into the creek because um, it's a nutrient. We still don't have that limit. Haven't had it for almost 20 years now. Uh, I don't see the state moving very quickly. It's been a real impact for us as far as being able to move forward with our, our facilities plan. So the, ones that, the slides I talked about before and this slide I'm talking about here right now is, is that anything that triggers a facilities plan update will most likely slow down whatever process this community wants to have regarding a uh, expansion. So my advice is, is that, that we try to avoid that as much as possible. The facilities plan situation will happen eventually. It's got to. But uh, the fact that it's, it's linked to this somewhat nebulous wastewater treatment plant issue, um, that, that, that's a stick in the spokes. And, and again, that it starts involving people that are not in this room or maybe not necessarily in this community. I said that, I stopped there to say that because here's the last trigger there, is that uh, depending on what areas that we choose and how dense that we make them, it's how much flow do we send to the treatment plants in addition to the flow that's there right now. There's a regulation that says that once your plant capacity reaches 95%, you have to do a facilities plan, you have to do an update, you have to do all the things I just talked about. And those red numbers at the bottom are, are how far we are away from each one of those plants. So whatever it is that we choose, if we decide to do a menu of areas based on that map that's back there and the ones that we're going to talk about, is, is that as long as we don't send more than 8 million gallons a day to one plant or 11 and a half to the other plant, we should be okay. Everybody's looking glassy-eyed. I, I had to finish with the hardest slide of all, so. Um, questions? Can, Charlie, can you put that in context when you're talking about 8 million? How many people would we, is there a better way to create an example of what that might look like? To where I phone my friends and get your calculators out and do the math for me real quick in here and stuff. Basically is that um, um, the study area, you know, so when you start getting into those large acres, you can just kind of do the math yourself, is that if you're talking about 2,000 developable acres and you're talking about 15 people per acre, then that, that tells you a population number. 
And I think we use like 80 gallons per day per person in order to uh, come up with what our number is. So they're, they're going to do that for us. Right now, like I said, when we go through each one of these maps, I said we're going to hone into that more about this is the impact on the receiving treatment plant that this ultimately gets to. And, and what I put that out there because I said what I'm going to be suggesting to, to this group is, is that however we slice and dice this, we try to make sure that we stay below those two thresholds that are right there. Sorry, what was it? 100,000 people. 100, people is the equivalent of what? Of 8 million. 100,000 people. Mr. Martin, quick, uh, quick question. What, so how is the capacity of those creeks established in the first part and can that change? I'm not sure I understand your question. So there's a rated capacity of those creeks. Uh, how is that established? And can that change over time? The, we're talking about the treatment plants. Yes. Yeah, the treatment plants. Okay. Those are established by the KPDS permit that is issued by the state um, and also reviewed by US EPA. Um, they're based on a whole lot of technical factors. Um, you can expand your plant, and that gets into that five-year thing that I just mentioned there. You can request a, a, a permit modification and go through the, the steps that are listed on there and basically spend five years expanding your plant. When I came here in 2000, they were in the process of expanding West Hickman up to the 33.8 it is right now. Um, it can be done. It's just time. I, I guess a follow-up to that, though, is, is the flow of those streams, is that part of the equation? And so with climate change, Certainly, this committee doesn't want to get into climate change, but if but if there's a change in flows over time, does that affect um, what can be discharged into those creeks, those streams? Um, no, because it's not necessarily flow-based. Um, Town Branch, for example, that is considered to be a zero-flow stream. So the permit discharge limits for that are super conservative because it's assuming there's no flow in there. And uh, during the summertime, like right now, we're most of the flow in it be, to begin with, to be quite honest with you. Um, it's, it's about the, the stream's ability to assimilate a pollutant loading. So when we talk about phosphorus is that, you know, phosphorus is a, is a nutrient. That's what causes algae blooms and all that. And so they want us to reduce the amount of, of phosphorus that is discharged into the stream. Right now, four milligrams per liter. We need to get it down below one, for example. That is just more treatment that needs to happen at the treatment plant in order to be able to reach that target number. So the changes in the stream aren't necessarily so much of the driver. It's the change at the treatment plant that removes whatever pollutant of concern that you're trying to remove. Does that make sense? OK. Thank you, Charlie, for that uh, presentation. It's a lot to chew on, and I have uh, a number of questions to throw at you. Um, when it comes to the flow contribution, um, what is the flow contribution of an acre inside the USA? It, it depends. <laughs> it depends, you know, is that uh, a school property, you know, sometimes doesn't necessarily contribute that much if it's got football fields and athletic fields and all those other kind of things like that. But typically, like I said, everything that we have been building to this point in time has been for the 15 people per acre along with a wet weather peaking factor that, that keeps everything in the pipe when we have a two-inch storm. Um, that's, that's the density model at which that we move at. In reality, would, would and, and Mr. Duncan may be better qualified to answer this than I would be or add to it, is that there might be a property over here that's pushing 20 and then another property over here that's only doing 10. And so in the aggregate of the catchment or the bathtub that I was talking about, we're still at that 15 acre, 15 people per acre or less. And that's, that's what we're really focused on. Okay, gotcha. Um, in regards to the um, regulatory impacts of expansion, talking about the, uh, needing a new plan submitted if we hit that 30% threshold of 100, almost 104,000 people, 
Um, do we have, and I don't know if you can answer this question, do we have estimates on when our population increase will hit that number? Uh, like what year? I don't know if we have like census uh, I, projections. I was on looking that. at the planning folks because I would, we would know. <laughs> Uh, Vice Mayor, we, we can make a calculation of that. I'm not sure we have. We, we may have the, that in the comprehensive plan, but we can certainly make that calculation. Okay. It would be can interesting we, to know when sort of naturally that's going to hit in relation to this. We estimate the comp plan based off of the Kentucky State Data Center projections. It's been historically fairly accurate, but we haven't done a projection of when we hit a certain threshold like that number. So that's something we could probably get back with. Okay. You. Correct. Uh, I'll say a lot of that depends on our land use practices and our goals for the community and how, you know, if those things for the future are the same as they've been in the past. So it's based on those sorts of trends as well. Right. Gotcha. Um, and then when, Charlie, when you're talking about the, um, the estimated time for a new plant versus, uh, like, uh, upgrading or whatever, a, uh, an existing plant, and then earlier when you were talking about the maps and certain scenarios where you wouldn't want, like, I might be confusing pump stations with treatment plants now, now that I think about it. Um, mm -hmm. When one of the maps you were talking about, I think it was out, um, let me find it here, excuse me. Uh, the map over like South Elkhorn. Um, okay, I am mixing up pump stations and treatment plants. But to, um, to move a pump station or to, you know, take one away and create a new one, what is, the cost and what is the timeline on doing something like that? Um, assuming that the land is available, that there's not a prolonged um, uh, expectation of, of acquiring the land, typically we allow 18 to 24 months to put in the piping and a pump station necessary in order to be able to go live. You know, that may not necessarily have all the landscaping done and all that, but it's in beneficial use. A lot of times for us, the driver is is acquiring the, the easements and the property necessary to be able to get moving with it. Um, to step back on your thing, you're not necessarily confusing them. I think you've actually picked up on something here that is really important. That X could be a treatment plant. It could be a pump station. It could be either one of those. And in many of the alternatives we looked at, we costed out both of them. Um, and I'll be honest with you, I think you'll find that what I found was is that the treatment plan option for a small footprint like this, the cost per acre doesn't make any sense economically. It just doesn't, doesn't add up. You pretty much need a large area. Um, one of the areas that, well, a combination of the three areas that we looked at were along the I-64 corridor. And, and they, they kind of overlap each other to some extent. But if you looked at all of them as an aggregate, just as land and as drainage, and basically you're talking about another West Hickman. You're talking about another town branch. I mean, basically, you're talking about tripling the, the capacity. Uh, the, the harsh realities of being able to do that are daunting and overwhelming, but when you're just drawing circles on a map and, and, and doing calculations, there's where the cost per benefit acre starts making sense with a treatment plan. Um, what and, and I know this probably depends on sort of the size of the service area too. Is what are we talking about in terms of costs for a treatment plant and also for a pump station? Um, a pump station is fractional in cost compared to a treatment plant. Like I said, we'll we'll get into that more when we start talking about the specific acres because I think I'm coming back next week um, to start really kind of peeling back the layers of the onion. Uh, I wanted to try to make sure I was had a good idea of which ones you wanted to talk about first. Uh, I know when I when I did goal four last year, um, Council Member Brown probably remembers that that um, you know we started and worked our way around the clock starting at number one. I'm not so sure that was what you all wanted to do because I'm not so sure that's really a good use of your time. If there's one er areas that you think you really want to drill down more based on what the council's expressed desires. So um, if I'm hearing you correctly, this is not something you want to ballpark without having some idea of where we're looking. Well, like I said, we have ballparked all of them, okay? And so, um, you know, what I thought, this is what I think I know. I thought I understood that um, um, there was a desire to focus along transportation routes, um, the primary transportation routes, 64, Athens, Boonesboro. 
Uh, I think there's a, a desire to um, try to make sure that we maximize the amount of developable land without introducing other things into it. And so in my mind, there's probably five or six areas that rise a little bit more to the top where the others that after about five minutes, I, my, I tell what I did is like, I don't want to do that. This, it economically doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. But it, it's not my decision, obviously, but I can kind of help guide the group. And then my last question, early in the presentation, we talked about um, the idea of um, like cost breaker for sewerability. Do you have, is there such thing as a cost map? Is there a map that you can show us where it's more expensive and less expensive to sewer? There is a, a, a table. Okay. So, um, but we can convert a table into a map. The problem with the map is, is that again, like with the scale of these maps to begin with, is that even on a screen, if I just took just that map and blew it up on the whole screen, it's still pretty busy and stuff. Uh, what I thought we might do, and again, except that's why I was hoping to get some suggestions out of how to approach this next time to make good use out of you, is that we would maybe focus on that map and make sure each one of you have uh, a copy of that spreadsheet so we can kind of walk through that a little bit. But yes, we have the data. We have the data. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. So you, you reference the triggers for an, either a new treatment plant or the expansion of existing treatment plants. For one example, it's 8 million gallons per day. How is that, is that monitored by actual usage? Is, is the plant saying, hey, we've used 8 million, dollars a day, 8 million gallons a day, now it's time to expand? Is it the time in which the actual has been population growth in a certain area? Or is it by virtue of an urban service area expansion automatically we have to expand these treatment plants because we know it's going to take years for some of these areas to be developed and for the actual sewer usage to become an effect right. the the flow is a more immediate trigger because we have to report that along with other parameters on a monthly basis to the state so if the state's doing what they should be doing they should be maybe should be figuring that out themselves so like with my calculation, the current three-year average, I got that from our, our DMRs, which are our monthly reports, and took the average of the three years. Um, that's the most obvious one. The least obvious one is the population one because, you know, I mean, we all are sometimes not sure about our population and, and as far as equivalent populations and stuff. Um, as far as allowing time for expansion, if that is decided, they typically are working with you to some, they being the state, to some degree. Uh, a permit cycle is five years, and they get really hung up on the permit cycle situation. So they, uh, they may start us down a path, and we may have to do some type of an agreed order or something like that that allowed us to expand one or, or the other of plants under an agreed order format that doesn't result in fines or anything like that that gets them outside this five-year window. Because typically, if you expand a plant, and especially if you are trying to deal with a different pollutant, you've got to make the improvements. Then you have to test for a period of time and then meet permit. That's hard to do in a five-year five -year window, especially if it's a big expansion. It may take you three years just to complete the work. Uh, some of you may have heard me say this before in other contexts, but working on a treatment plant is hard because you're basically working on your car while you're driving down the road. You can't turn the treatment plant off and fix it. And I'm sorry, just so I fully understand, th theoretically, if if, the, the, if population growth was not a question, if the acreage identified by uh, virtue of this process it was not enough to say there's a 30% population growth, when would this three to five year process start? Would it be at the time in which we wake up and go, okay, we've increased our sewer output into these treatment facilities. It's too much now, and then we have to start a multi-year process to fix that. Is there, is there any risk of overloading these existing treatment plants because we didn't put enough gallons per day in there to trigger an expansion? My, what I would suggest that we do is that if we, 
when we finally decide what we're doing expansion wise, what we're doing density wise and all that, and if that's and those numbers uh, create the trigger, uh, then we start working on uh, approaching the state about uh, making the expansions as are necessary. Uh, that's not the part that worries me about it is, is, is once you get into it and this lingering issue with town branch that they haven't seemed to be able to figure out. Um, you know, we've, we, they've advertised a new permit limit. You have to do public notice for uh, permit changes. And they've done public notice, as based on my recollection, at least three times. And three times they've pulled it back because everybody came out of the woodwork basically challenging it. And uh, so they just went back and didn't do anything. Except it's been, it's unusual for a treatment plant to not have a permit, an active permit for 20 years. Any further questions for Mr. Marks? Councilmember Brown. Thank you, Director. Um, again, a lot of useful information. So on the map that shows the pump stations in green, are those all pump stations that LFUCG controls and maintains? Yes. So, um, well, those are only what we call Class A, and those are the larger structural um, um, pump stations. But yeah, we don't, um, there's not very many pump stations that we are not responsible for. We're responsible for pretty much anyone in the, especially in the urban service area, unless it serves one house or one building, so to speak. Okay, so that, that's, what, that's what my next question was gonna be. Because I thought um, last summer you had mentioned that there are some that are out there that we have, that you have requested to talk to the owners about us taking control of because they're not working efficiently. But maybe I, yeah, they might be in the rural, they may be in the rural area, no, not the urban area. I think areas. I said that we already did. Okay, <laughs> so okay. Pretty much we already did. Um, you know, the, the, the horse park. The horse park had a treatment plant that was failing and we stepped in as a government and basically they built the pump station and then we took the pump station over and we we're operating it. Same thing at Spindletop. Uh, on the other side of the map, Blue Sky was a failing treatment plant when the consent decree came along and we agreed in the context of the consent decree in order to take over Blue Sky. And we built a uh, pump station out there to replace that treatment plant uh, as a supplemental environmental project. Along the way, inside the new circle, I mean, inside I-75 behind Wendy's, there was a treatment plant there as well. The uh, owners approached us about building a pump station and having it serviced through the Blue Sky thing. So, you know, it's, I don't recall that, um, okay. Council Member Brown, as far as to my knowledge, except we have stuff that is outside the air, the urban service area already, at the airport, uh, at um, uh, the horse park, uh, out at Blue Sky, um, we have those already and we take care of those. The only one I can think of right now that's still private is Lexington Country Club. Now that I think through that, Lexington Country Club has their own pipeline that comes down uh, Paris Pike. How that happened, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and I thought it was I thought it was more out there that we weren't aware of or, or wasn't under our control that. He just reminded me of another one. See, I'm winking yeah. it here now. Okay. There is one, and we're going to talk about that one when we start talking about areas. Okay. Okay. And then with this map, you, you were talking about Lexington sits on a ridge and, and water flows uh, different directions. Can you kind of just just generally maybe show us where that ridge is and what direction water flows? Because I think that may be important for us to consider if, if we're looking at areas and trying to determine you know, where potential residential growth might take place and what treatment facility would be the, that where that, that um, water would go to get treated. Does that make sense? I think so. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this with me if I can. Okay. Uh, you wanted me to use my pointer that you like so much, but I got a different one now. <laughs> I gotta quite get it out. I'm not using the baseball bat, I use the- That looks day, more right? like a weapon yeah, yeah. than a pointer. Yeah. So here is the ridge line, basically right there. Because everything that, that a drop of water or sewage, a, a toilet that flushes right there goes to that green dot. It follows that purple line down to that green dot. 
Same thing happens downtown here, is that here's UK, they've got a whole set of trunk sewers over there. Here's uh, Main Street, everything joins together and ends up at Town Branch. Town Branch, unfortunately though, is in the middle of the drainage area because it was built in 1918. And since that time, we've added all of this stuff out here, including Masters and Station. So the, the trunk sewer, the, the toilet that flushes here, has to come to this green dot, which is in front of the federal medical uh, facility, and then pump back to Town Branch. That's just the way it is, and it's probably the way it's always going to be. So you've got a watershed here that's controlled by this green dot, that's South Elkhorn. Here's Wolf Run. Over here, we've got two dots that are cane run because the joining point is actually closer out here to the horse park than here, but that's where the urban service boundary stops. Where those pump stations are at, they're there because that's where the boundary is. And that historically, we've not built facilities outside the urban service boundary unless we were required to under the federal situation here with the consent decree or in some cases where the state approached the government and said, we need your help because we don't want to be in the treatment plant business. And so there's a separate council approved agreement to serve the horse park and uh, spindle top. There's an agreement also for the pump stations that are out here at Keeneland and, uh, and the airport. But basically when you add to the urban service boundary, we'll use this one as the example because it's probably one we're gonna talk a lot about. You know, like I said, our, our interest is not whether or not how much land we add or not, is our interest is, is those two green dots can turn into one. Uh, that's the most efficient situation for us. So if those two, those two can turn into one, I, would need, I need less people to be able to take care of things. If I have a storage tank out there, then I'm sending less wet weather flow to one of my two treatment plants. I'm gonna be sending base flow because you can't use the storage tanks for base flow. So the base flow number needs to stay low enough that it doesn't push us past the 95% that I talked about before. So this, this talking in round numbers is that if this is, adds five million gallons a day to the, uh, to, the, to the mix and it pumps all the way here to Town Branch, okay. When it doesn't trigger the facilities plan, it doesn't really trigger any, it just gets us closer to having to do that, but it's not the trigger itself. Otherwise, if it, it, you've got even more room down here at West Hickman because it's 11.5. Mm -hmm. So you've got to, you, wherever you're going to serve stuff, you're going to have a number that is additional base flow, and you're going to have to compare that additional base flow with whatever treatment plant that it's going to because it's got to get there at some point in time. The wet weather flow can be dealt with by building storage tanks. You're going to have to build them in some case or another. Using this one as an example right here, this is North Elkhorn. Um, <clears throat> this is Hamburg right here. And, th and those two green dots flow to the Town Branch. They don't go to West Hickman. They, those two this one, stations. this one pumps to this one, which pumps to Town Branch. They pump because the drainage goes in this direction, away from both. There's no physical gravity connection between these two because of this ridge line. Everything on this side of the ridge goes this way. Everything on this side of the ridge either goes that way or goes that way. Okay. So I, so I have another, well, I have another thought, but it might be too premature to, 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 to bring it up, but I think all that information was helpful. And Vice Mayor, I know you had a question. I didn't want to answer it, leave something out. <laughs> sure, thank you. Um, my question was, um, you've kind of pointed out and it, and it seems fairly obvious where the ridge line goes inside the USA. Can you kind of point out how much further the ridge line goes within Fayette County and into the rural area and kind of which direction it goes? It I have goes. a different map for that that I didn't bring with me. How about if I make sure that I have that at the top of the list for Perfect. next week to, to better explain that? Great. I mean, basically the, the Cane Run is basically becomes Georgetown's water supply. That's one of the things that we work really hard at is that as you go further out the Cane Run area, Newtown Pike, uh, Russell Cave, is that the, the stream disappears into underground and then it pops back up and mainly pops up in the Royal Springs Aquifer in downtown Georgetown. Um, North Elkhorn 
actually is a stream that eventually joins in with South Elkhorn and ends up in the Kentucky River, but way outside our county. But I'll have something that illustrates the, the actual drainage stuff outside the urban service boundary next time. Great, thank you. Charlie, you'd asked a couple of times for us to specifically kind of tell you what would be helpful to us. I think one thing that would be helpful is if you did get with maybe the planning staff and you all agree on these corridor areas that meet the council's criteria that we're considering expansion in and put your data on those map areas for us to look at. I think for me, when we're looking at those, it would be helpful to know what in your mind would be the most efficient way to get it to which treatment plant in, in terms of how many pump stations you think it would require in those areas or at, at the minimum which pump which treatment plant it would flow to uh, in any of these corridor areas that we're going to be looking at I think that would be really helpful as we kind of go through it and just to clarify another thing that you had talked about on the um, the trigger so I'm kind of I'm I'm I kind of operate like if my meeting starts at nine o'clock, I'm gonna be here at like maybe a quarter or 10 till. It sounds like from your last comment, that's why I'm asking to clarify, on these triggers for the 95% capacity before you have to do something with your facilities plan, at, when you, when you reach uh, five millions of the eight million gallons that you've got to use before you get to that 95%, it sounds like we're not needing to look at it any time before we get to that actual 8 million gallons used. Is that is that right? See, I wouldn't wait. And so I apologize if maybe you misunderstood. See, I'm the guy who starts work at 7 and I'm here at 5.30, so. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> the, uh, uh, I would start now because all the stuff that's in the middle of that, uh, those um, um, slides I had, in the spreadsheets, there's a lot going on in there. Sure. Yeah, a lot. And a lot of it is not on our time frame, is that if there needs to be environmental reviews and some of the other things that need to go on. Like I said, I, I've been trying to get a new permit for Town Branch for 20 years and I ain't got there yet. And so uh, I, that seems a little bit of a daunting task for me and I, I'm, I want to start yesterday. Um, you know, I've tried, I've had that in my budget, uh, my annual budget three times probably in the last five years. Because uh, as we wind down with the consent decree, we're not there yet, but we're winding down. And to me, it was really important that we had an updated facilities plan that helped guide our sewer planning for the next 20 years. I felt like that was gonna be, as I walk out the door, that would be the legacy thing that I would leave for everybody else. And I still wanna get that done. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad I asked that question to clarify. And so how does that, so you feel like that where we're at today based on where we're at with our capacity right now at the plants, we need to be looking at the next step, whether that is an expansion of those current existing treatment plants or considering the third treatment plant starting today. Yes. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll just say for the record and for my opinion, I hope we do that before you walk out the door <laughs> because in my opinion, you're an asset. The, the history you've got and, and the job that you've done running our sewer system here through the consent decree and everything, I would hope that you would be on point getting us at least to that before you, you do walk through that door. Thank you. Yeah, I'll start by saying I hope we block you from walking out the door. <laughs> no, no uh, that's one of the reasons why Chris Dent's here. <laughs> He's much younger than I am. So I was going to, I had originally planned to make the request for the map of the arterials, the things that are in the councils charged us about where this development might occur. I think that would be helpful to get that to us as soon as we can get it. The other thing, I, and I don't know that this is a question as much as something I'm just trying to think through. Y'all can tell me if there's a question in there. We're talking about this like our projected increase in population is going to go out here in this expansion area, and um, it may, and that means lots of miles of new sewer, but in terms of what we're doing in planning right now is for our infill and redevelopment areas and those areas that don't have anything or that can be better used, we're doing much denser planning, 
and how do we factor that into these conversations and should we be factoring that into these conversations? Do we have any idea, uh, do we have any way of projecting how much of our population growth might be in that area as opposed to out in the expansion area? And, and I don't have, I'm not asking for an answer right now, I'm just thinking out loud. Well, I would like to comment on though, is that as I said before, Population uh, increases are harder for a regulator to be able to determine, especially when you're not adding geographic land. You know, is that even in our our, um, our capacity assurance program, I mean, it's fairly detailed, but we don't know whether six people live in one house or one person lives in a house. We just treat it as a house. There's no way you would necessarily be able to figure that out. But I, I, it kind of goes maybe into something that Todd had mentioned earlier that I, I thought about and then I forgot and I want to bring back up. And it has to do with that treatment plant example is that, you know, some we looked at all different alternatives that were plausible. One plausible alternative, depending on the, the, the eyes of the beholder, is, is that you build a treatment plant here in North Elkhorn and you send all of the flow that's in North Elkhorn to that treatment plant you've now taken the existing North Elkhorn off of Town Branch, and you've reclaimed capacity in Town Branch. That has some benefit when you start talking about infill and redevelopment, is you've expanded your plant by not turning a shovel full of dirt at that plant because you took the flow away from it. And we spent a lot of time kind of going through that. And again, like I said, when we start covering some of these areas, hopefully we'll try to be able to at least articulate to you all about what the the cost benefit of, of that outcome might be, that alternative. I got a comment to uh, uh, Ms. Worf's point, and I think it's I think it's a very good point. But I think, you know, what could help us is you know if we're if we're talking about zoning residential zoning, maybe we could use numbers that are the max, you know, in, in regards to density for the units in the bedrooms. So if we're, so that could be something that we can take into consideration when identifying land or, or proposing uh, spaces. We can't predict what's gonna happen with the infill uh, just cause projects come and projects go. But if we're looking at residential zoning in some of these areas that we can, can are considering, then if we look at the max in regards to density in bedrooms, then that would help us think about where to send that capacity and that, that water flow. Just a thought. Any further questions, Ms. Worth? Just a, just a clarification. We're talking. We've been talking only about residential. We haven't talked about industrial out in this area. Is that something we need to think about, or are we ruling that out, or what are the, what's the game here? Well, I, I'm not really dictating that one way or another. Like I said I, I'm trying to avoid the um, the making a recommendation on anything, and instead um, uh, just telling you how to sewer it. But I know I won't be able to completely do that. Uh, again, back to my comment before is that whatever density we choose, that it, if it's in an aggregate of the service area that you're talking about adding, I don't think there's a whole lot of risk by having 18 over here and 14 over here as long as that number is in the middle of what, or, or in the range of what we're talking about. I keep looking over at my capacity guy to see if he's cl clutching his chest over there. Um, the, um, um, so, you know, you could have that mix type of thing because like a factory, depending on warehouse, Amazon. Amazon doesn't necessarily generate that much sewage. It takes up a huge footprint, but it doesn't generate that much sewage. It's got a few um, um, restrooms in it and stuff. Uh, a dairy, that's a completely different uh, operation and stuff like that. So um, I, obviously when you start laying out the, the details of the system as far as whether there's eight inch pipes going there or 12 inch pipes going there, it's wherever that drain is, as long as it has the overall ability to serve whatever density you projected for everything that drains to it, you should be okay. And Mr. Chair, uh, Ms. Worth, you'll recall when you look at the direction from council there is the, the requirement that we consider land use for a wide array of jobs. So I believe we will be looking at, at, at non-residential uses as well, particularly employment type uses. Okay, Mr. Martin, thank you. I have one question. Ask away. Okay, so for next time. Um, do you want to go in the order that it appears in the report 
or do you want to um, us to work with planning to determine which ones of those um, check the boxes that of the, or the charge that you were given? The second option. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I was clear on that. Yeah. I think it, there's not any more questions. Appreciate your time and your efforts, too. Thank you so much. Uh, so... One last thing. Yes, sir. And it's probably for the audience as well, because I know many people have asked me about this. Uh, I spent more time getting ready for this presentation when I came back from uh, from vacation than I did reviewing the report. We have the 90% report. I'm about maybe two thirds of the way through it. I should have all my comments back to Stantec by the end of the week. Hopefully, maybe by the end of next week, that we will have it out there for everyone posted on our website that they can they can look at it because I felt like that it would make a more purposeful yes. discussion. Okay. okay. Thanks for that. That's All good right. information. Um, Mr. Dunk, you know, we have other business, and uh, I wanted to just mention uh, just the attendance piece. I know um, it's not mandatory <laughs> or anything, <laughs> but please, please, if you can, show up um, because these meetings are televised, um, but if you are not in attendance, then you cannot provide your opinion so it's going to be a little more difficult. So thank you for the ones that have shown up today and last week. But again, I know it's tough. Uh, we have certain folks out for different reasons, and that's fine. We kind of threw this out on them, so we give them a pass. But we're not taking any attendance um, <laughs> numbers or anything like that. But please just try to um, come to every meeting if you can. Uh, that would be awesome. But Mr. Duncan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just to, to punctuate the schedule, if you all recall, looking at the next three Tuesdays, we, we call that building the map. And so Charlie has mentioned uh, that he will have his, his layers uh, with our GIS layers, and that will help guide you all on that. And we will certainly uh, be prepared to help give you a starting point next week when you do that. So as the Chair uh, stated, if, if you can be here, particularly for the next three weeks when we're working on drafting that map, preparing that for public comment, I believe that will be very helpful. And, I, and we will certainly ask Charlie and his team to be here and Beth and her team to be here as well to help guide us on this. And if you all can think of any additional resources besides that that we're unable, that, we, that have not been presented so far, we will be happy to try to get those as well. And then the questions that have been posed to us, we'll have those ready for you next week as well. Thank you. Uh, Director Duncan, do you, um, this might be a technology question, is there a way once we have all these different maps with different criteria and things happening on them, is there a way to overlay the maps once we start looking? So if somebody asks for like, can we get the survivability map with a you know, PDR map, all that stuff lay on top of each other? Electronically, that's absolutely possible. It gets a little busy if you try to print something like that, but certainly right. in an electric, electronic version, uh, Chris Dorge can turn those layers off and on and show how they interact. Great. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Oh, Ms. Plumlee. Councilman. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry I missed the, the first meeting because we were on break and I was physically out of town. But my question has to do, I was, I was a little startled when I saw the schedule. I just thought it looked so fast. And having served on Gold 4, I know we were up against it went really fast. We wanted to have more meetings. In reading the minutes today, I did see the word flexibility. So as we're moving forward with that schedule, will we have the opportunity to add more meetings? Mr. Chair, if I, I'll, I'll be glad to give this a try. Uh, Councilmember Plumman, when we were talking about flexibility, it was really more in uh, the time of the meeting or the location of the meeting and that sort of thing, not necessarily the schedule, although I wouldn't presume to say that if you all needed more time, you couldn't do that. But I will tell you that we have built this around the council's schedule of addressing the expansion by December 1st, 2024. And in order to do that and to bring a consultant in for the master plan, this is the schedule that we really, really need to try to stay on if we can. And, and I know it's bold. I know it's unlike most things that we do. Mm -hmm. But I'd also believe that, that we'll certainly be responsive to get you the information and uh, updates that you need. And I think also by meeting as frequently as we are, this will stay in the fore of our minds. And so we'll be fresh when we, when we come back 
and be able to make good decisions. We're going to do our best to help you all do that. And I appreciate that. I'm sure we all do. And December 1st, 2024 is the completion target, correct? And, and you feel that we have to have this part completed so that the consultant, we don't have the consultant yet, correct? That's correct. Okay. And we hope to have a, we hope to have a consultant on board by, uh, in, in October of this year. And then that would give them about a year to work on the master plan, designing the land, uh, designating the land uses, designing the infrastructure, and all of that, uh, as well as any new regulatory scheme that we need for this, uh, in order to get that back for a public hearing with the planning mm -hmm. commission uh, sometime in November of 2024. Um, I think that uh, again, I look. At, I was on the group for or the goal four, and I think the some of the perception with constituents out there is we just try to do too much in a, in a quick window. So I hope that we you know, you will be sensitive and there is some flexibility, whatever that may look like, because these are important decisions, very important decisions. And I don't want us to look, and I'm using the word reckless loosely, but I just want to make sure we dot our, our I's and cross our T's on this one. Thank you, Director. Thank you, Chair. Vice Mayor. Thank you. Um, I'm going to echo Council Member Plowman's um, concerns about that, and I think it is going to be a real delicate balance with this tight deadline, um, the amount of time we, we want to leave for the consultant. And for me, you know, in a perfect world, I always like to leave a good cushion for in case things go haywire, you still have a little time to, to fix things. Uh, but having said that, that the seven weeks is definitely very, very aggressive. Um, and I share Council Member Plowman's, uh, Plowman's sentiment on um, that balance of having enough information, <clears throat> excuse me, to, to get this right um, and not rush if we don't have to rush through it. So I'm here to, to try to hit this deadline if we can along with the rest of us, um, but I wouldn't mind uh, as it goes forward potentially having some flexibility, and I think that's... Um, I assume that's a decision that this group can make if we wanted to, for example, extend time or add time to it, right? Thank you. Yes, Council Member Brown. That's what you get when you put so many council members on a committee. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I appreciate the clarification about the timeline. Um, you know, I got questions or, or somebody asked me if, if the lawsuit that was filed is, is setting this timeline and I think the response I got from you all when I asked yesterday is that we would have been on this timeline anyway and I think the cushion that we're trying to set is for the planning commission and the consultant to do their work because all we're going to do is submit a recommendation so our recommendation that's going to come out of this committee goes to the planning commission right and not the consultant Councilmember Brown it will go first to the planning commission who will then through a mechanism, accept the uh, or, or respond somehow to the work of this committee in order to provide guidance in the form of a map to the consultants who can then will then set about on the master planning process. Okay. So with that, I think it would be helpful for this group to uh, have a chance to look over the RFP that, that we have put out for the consultant just so we know what, what we're looking for and what we're asking of them. So if, if that could be shared with this group, I think that would be beneficial going forward. So thanks for the clarification on the timeline. And then I know it's aggressive, but uh, I think we're trying to give other folks that are going to be in this decision-making process more time to do, uh, do their work as well. So thanks. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for your comments. Um, and I was going to ask for comments and questions, but I think we had them already. Uh, is there any additional? concerns or comments or questions okay all right then well if not it is 11:55. <laughs> this meeting is adjourned thank you